Welcome, friends and comrades, to another interview hosted by the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. Today, we'll be talking with some comrades from Class Unity, a Marxist organization that was formerly associated with DSA, but that has recently left. We'll discuss the DSA, why Class Unity left, and we'll also discuss the recent class on fascism, frequent misunderstandings of fascism, and what the Marxist position on it is. Without further ado, let's get started with our introduction. much class unity guys for joining us today we're so excited about this uh we followed your work and your positions within dsa pretty closely and even more closely since you left the ranks so it's a pleasure for us uh we really have to say we're very impressed with all of this uh but before we get to any of that kind of stuff can you tell us maybe a bit about class unity itself how how did you guys get started how did you form yeah thanks for having us on uh, can you hear me uh, so Class Unity started as a Marxist caucus within the Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, I'm sure a lot of your viewers are familiar with with the DSA. Uh, it's a it's a big tent socialist organization. It's the biggest socialist organization in the United States, and uh, Class Unity started as a as a faction within it, uh, which identified three problems. Uh, with the DSA that also happened to be problems with uh, the broader left. Uh, the first one being that uh, many of its members were uh, just not uh, schooled in, in Marxist theory and uh, Marxist understanding of, of politics and socialism. Uh, a lot of them just didn't understand socialism. Uh, the, the demographic of the DSA was largely middle class and, and it continues to be middle class uh, which is a problem because uh, uh, socialism is really um, it's a theory and a movement for for working people and uh, uh, the, the 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 largely middle class demographic of the DSA did not understand not only is the wrong uh, constituency to build for for socialist politics but it didn't understand that about itself uh, and didn't understand the need um, to organize the working class. And uh, another big problem that was coming up was the DSA was engaging in these big political projects, these campaigns, uh, especially electoral campaigns, uh, without uh, before it was ready to do so, basically. So it ran a lot of candidates for office and won a lot of uh, campaigns and got a lot of uh, openly, uh, you know, explicitly socialist people on the map, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, uh, you know, Cory Bush, Jamal Bowman, a lot of, a lot of socialist um, Congress people we know today are, are from the DSA, uh, but it had no way to hold them accountable. And uh, uh, basically the inevitable uh, result of that was that, um, Everybody that the DSA brought to office turned our turned its turned their backs on on socialist politics once they got into office, 
and they basically became um, regular run-of-the-mill Democrats. So class unity was a an attempt to correct that, to, to re re-steer the ship on a better course. And after a few years of trying really hard, we realized that uh, <laughs> this is a lost cause and uh, probably the best way to make ourselves useful to uh, socialist politics in America is to uh, regroup as an independent Marxist organization uh, and stop trying to reform the DSA. Wow. Yeah, I find, you know, it's interesting. This seems to be, like you said, a problem on the broader left. Um, the the sort of middle class nature of the, the last period of American history and, you know, the fall of the Soviet Union and all of this led to this middle class. And there's a lot more that, that we could go into, but it led to the, the middle class takeover of what we call the left. And with all of the distortions, the lack of Marxism uh, being taught regularly in, in concrete institutions, we get all of these people with a very vague idea of socialism that they sort of pick up here and there from the internet or even get directly misinformed. And you get these middle-class people who look at you and go, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm the proletariat, <laughs> you know, or college students. Um, and so it can be really frustrating because when you try to break down the Marxist view of it um, and the relations of production, the, the, all they do is sort of get hurt feelings about it because they baked this into their middle class identity, right? It's part of identity building these days. And so you're, you're saying, hey, that part of you isn't actually you, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a real problem these days. But I, I don't want to be all mopey about it because it is changing. The working class in this country is getting energized and Marxism is coming back. And I think organizations like Class Unity are proof positive of that, you know? So you you told us a little bit about your critique of the DSA, but um, you guys have, you were in the DSA for um, about three years. I know there's members who have been in the DSA for a whole lot longer. Um, can you tell us the immediate reasons why you felt it was necessary to disassociate uh, with the DSA? Because I think that those are important to touch on. And I feel like they, they're they part of this uh, escalation that culminates in something as absurd as uh, self-proclaimed socialist candidates uh, voting in favor of the illegalizing of a, of a rail strike. So uh, would you mind touching on that uh, a little bit and the role that that played in, in getting you guys over, um, you know, to, to the point of wanting to fully leave and disassociate from DSA? Yeah, it's so funny. I remember uh, when I joined the DSA in 2021, I immediately started getting into arguments with with members about look at look at this thing that AOC did and these other, you know, DSA electeds, and I always got a lot of pushback. Uh, so when I saw when I saw Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and Jamal Bowman and Cory Bush uh, vote uh, to, to break a strike essentially uh, to uh, legally prohibit uh, the uh, rail workers of America from going on strike. Uh, I thought that <laughs> there's no way any socialist would be okay with any of this, uh, but uh, we tried our best in class unity to uh, to try to get those members expelled from the DSA and to, to unendorse and to withdraw all support. Uh, but uh, it, it doesn't look like that's happening. Uh, it does not even close. So uh, that was the, that was the final straw for us. That was kind of the, uh, the moment where, we kind of had to come to terms that we can't stop pretending that this is going anywhere, uh, that the DSA will ever be uh, a force for socialist politics, 
uh, or will ever become a workers' party. If anything, it stands in the way of 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 the development of a workers' party by 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 running these candidates and frankly giving a giving a bad name to socialism. So that was the moment where where we realized, you know, we got to stop this. Yeah. Do do uh, Eric or Andy? Do either of you have something to add to that or? Uh, yeah, so like I would just um, reemphasize that. Like for me, that was also kind of the last straw. Like it seemed pretty obvious that if you're claiming to be a socialist, you don't you don't vote to break a strike. Um, you know, and then something else. So I'm a relatively new member to Class Unity. I actually joined just a couple months ago. Um, I was actually talking to Hefestian. Um, when I was being recruited. And um, another thing he mentioned that I think is telling is, um, so they have, I think it was in 2021, they had a resolution to uh, uh, to basically try to become more independent of the Democratic Party by using, uh, uh, building their own infrastructure for um, electoral software. Because currently when they're doing canvassing uh, and things like that, they're relying on uh, software that's controlled by the DNC. So whenever they're getting voter data, it's also going to the DNC. And it sounds like to me, they, even though it's on the books, they haven't been really prioritizing this project. And I don't know, my instincts tell me that this organization isn't really uh, what it's representing itself to be. So. Yeah, I I remember when that happened, uh, and there was a big hullabaloo about changing all of that with some DSA folks I'm friends with. Any anything else, Eric, or or do you think this subject's covered? Well, I personally haven't had that much experience with the DSA, so I, I don't have necessarily a personal take on it. But just, you know, just yeah. what Andy and Hef have said about, you know, strike breaking and the inability to even distinguish. Um, if, if this is the premier socialist organization in America, and in mm. many respects it becomes indistinguishable from the Democratic Party, then, you know, it raises a lot of questions. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> so, you know, right. And I... There's there's some folks in the comments that are asking, like, um, what's the point of attacking the middle class? You know, isn't the enemy the ruling class? And I think both things are true at the same time. We obviously have uh, the, the main antagonism with with the ruling class. Um, but if you're trying to build a successful socialist movement and you have folks whose political practices are dominated by what class unity has termed the iron triangle of academia, media and NGOs, um, and that, you know, has a certain social consciousness that's not in line with, uh, fully in line with the biggest chunk of the working masses in the country, um, whose outlook um, in the sort of jargon that we use at our institute is dominated by the purity fetish, um, you know, that they make uh, the vast majority of organizational meetings feel like HR meetings. That sort of structure presents a fundamental fetter, an obstacle for socialist organizing, for socialist organizing to link up with the working class. So in a sense, it's it's not that the main antagonism that we have is with these middle classes, but it's with the fact that the way that they're engaging in politics is an obstacle for genuine the genuine advancement of the class struggle. And beyond that, the fact that, as you mentioned, uh, that they're not conscious of this. And there doesn't seem to be a consciousness of this, in part because of the lack of a genuine class analysis, uh, which would allow them to reflect objectively on what position it is that they're holding in terms of class and society. Um, or if folks want to work within a broader understanding of class, what strata of the working class it is that they're in. Um, but when that's absent and everything's uh, homogenized to the sort of dichotomy that comes with the um, you know, the uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, protests of the 1% versus the 99%, although that might be helpful in some instances, um, at some point you need to have a technical understanding of class, a scientific understanding of class of the kind that Marx produces in Capital and in other works. Um, and 
If you don't have that, you're unable to see these sort of differences that exist within the working masses, within the mass of people that do have to sell their labor power in order to survive, that do survive off of wages and, and salaries of different forms, but who, because of the differences that they hold with relationship to the means of production, uh, because of certain cultural differences that are created in their lifestyles, uh, certain historical differences, you know, we read this class as um, largely a result of the decline of the objective uh, material conditions of the middle class, but the sustenance of their middle class social consciousness, which is a phenomenon that Noah calls reproletarianization. So you have all of this going on, and it's not that the middle class is like the main enemy, it's just that they're kind of standing as an obstacle towards a fight against the real enemy, which is the owning class. What, what do you guys yeah. have to say with regards to that question? Well, I think it's important, first off, to just make the distinction when we attack the middle classes or uh, the managerial class, the PMC, like this is not a moral category. We're not castigating people for belonging to the class. I mean, let's face it. I mean, there are a lot of leftists who are PMC, including members of class unity. And that's been the case, you know, going back decades. So um, it's not a moral um, uh, attack, but it is an attempt at an analytic clarification of how class dynamics have uh, changed and transformed in certain respects, really as a result of the nature of industrial production as, you know, this really took off in the 19th century and then, you know, just transformed so much of life in the 20th century. And so... I think that the analysis kind of has to come from, on the one hand, thinking how um, just the concern with management, the concern with administration and with, you know, finessing um, you know, institutional life and so forth. It comes about as a result of industrial capitalism, just because as industry becomes more complicated, more intellectual work is required to, you know, maintain its efficiency. Uh, and so forth. And so there, there become, you know, this is in, uh, you know, early turn of the, the century, you had um, the growth of so-called scientific management. So Taylorism, mm -hmm. for these attempts at, you know, maximizing the efficiency of industrial production. And what this essentially does is it separates intellectual from manual labor. So the people working in the fa factories are no longer the ones um, planning production. And that function is separated to, you know, like a higher cream of the management strata. But at the same time, you also have the tremendous, you know, this cultural changes that come about with the growth of the middle class in the 20th century. So sort of like the, the golden age of the American middle class after World War II um, is you have, you know, uh, several generations of people who, you know, have rising uh, uh, upward mobility. They're attending universities. So university education is um, becoming much more prevalent and widespread and common. So on the one hand, yes, you have a division and just the division of labor itself between intellectual and manual labor. But then as uh, Carlos, you were saying, there's also emerges this sort of cultural rift. Um, that kind of, to, to put it somewhat simply, emerges from just the distinction between people who went to college and people who didn't. Um, but, you know, this, this kind of becomes all of the shibboleths of management, culture, administration, all manner of like technocratic um, bureaucracy um, that, you know, people are justly and naturally alienated by. And that just becomes a cultural rift sort of and you, you see that a lot in populist politics um just from the past 10 years but yeah. this cultural rift between the um the administrators the bureaucrats um i mean it, it, it's kind of hard to talk about this in two concrete terms because we're talking about a very wide range of professions like everything from lawyers engineers teachers journalists so you know there's tremendous variety there um but uh, yeah, nonetheless, this this sort of it's a cultural but also economic um, division that has emerged, and that you know really has been a, a major concern for 
not just cultural politics, but also with globalization and sort of the evisceration of uh, the working classes and during the neoliberal era, and that kind of being replaced by, um, you know, bullshit jobs, and whether that's administration or what have you. So it's a complicated process. Um, and we're trying really, our goal is to understand it um, historically, materially, and culturally, because ultimately, you know, um, it's, it's all part of the same yeah, this is, it's weird. You're describing exactly what I'm describing in my paper that's coming out on what a, what we call reproletarianization, which is this new death of the middle class. And mm -hmm. we've sort of been addressing um, our next question anyway. So I'm, I'm going to skip over that. I'm going to comment on something instead. A lot of the chat have some questions about class and middle class isn't a thing and this and that. Um Guys, Marx uses the term middle class all the time. It's a fine term to use. Don't get hung up on definitions. Remember what Engels says about definitions, right? They're, they're, they're good in shortcuts, but they're the depth of scientific thinking. A middle class is something with a, that's no longer within the contradiction of society. And after World War II, there was a large section of the working class that moved up and lost its proletarian character because of this. So you really got to analyze a thing. Remember the basic Marxism, right? We analyze things in their motion and their interconnection. So I, yeah, I just wanted to uh, touch on that before we move on with the next one, which I believe that's, that's you, Carlos. Yeah, I, I think we should stay on the topic of the middle class because I sure. think that there's a little bit more to flesh out. Hef, I think you had something uh, to say. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I agree that it's it's important not to be, I guess, too harsh or too um, rigid in thinking that, you know, you, you know, we, we shouldn't we shouldn't say that we hate the middle class. We shouldn't say that the, the middle class is the enemy of the working class because uh, it's true that it's the ruling classes that are the enemy of the working class uh and uh, definitely there are some some members of the middle class that that have high positions in management that you could also consider enemies but middle class is a broad term uh, i think uh throughout history uh the most successful left-wing movements uh are movements that have been able to uh, r rally the working class and many members of the middle class by appealing uh, universally to their interests. For example, uh, the movement for Medicare for all here in the United States would benefit a lot of middle class people. Uh, so there are a lot of middle class people who, you know, have a hard time paying the bills and uh, who would benefit from these like universal campaigns. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if somebody, so if somebody says, you know, what about me, uh, you know, a nurse making barely minimum wage, aren't I working class? Or what about me? I'm a teacher and I can barely pay the bills. Aren't I working class? I would say that you do have to be careful sometimes uh, to understand where the interests of the middle class and the working class diverge. And I can give an example of that. In the DSA, there was a, and outside the DSA, in the past few years, there's been a huge push to defund the police, uh, which is not a, a policy that, in my opinion, can really rally the working class because working class people, they might not, uh, they might not appreciate the presence of the police who incarcerate uh, and in, imprison a lot of members of the working class, but they do sort of understand there, there is this general understanding that we want safe neighborhoods. I think, I don't think anybody, you know, no, you know, or no, no ordinary person is going to deny that. So the, the, this movement to abolish the police or defund the police, in my opinion, not at all popular among the working class. Uh, and, and it's funny if you ask the question, who would this benefit? who would this program of taking money away from police officers and diverting those funds to, um, you know, uh, preventative 
measures like social work or education, you're taking money away from one one section of the middle class, the police, and giving it to another section, social workers and and educators. So that's just that's just a policy that act, that that benefits one portion of the middle class, which is no surprise, which makes it no surprise that an organization like the DSA is pushing it forward. But that's an example of uh, of a policy that, you know, might attract some middle class people, but overall will alienate the working class and uh, and and hurt, you know, uh, work against the solidarity that we need in a, in a working class movement. If we have no real understanding of these middle classes, it's very hard to understand modern organizing. Why I am a carpenter. I was asked all the time in meetings, why don't you bring your coworkers? You say you've, you know, converted them all. They love communism now. They want working class power now. Why don't you bring them? And I have to kind of not mention that, well, I'm embarrassed of you guys, right? Because you run this thing like it's an HR meeting and you run it in a very middle class manner where you're you're concerned with your middle class concerns and there's nothing wrong with that but they're not proletarian concerns they're not what is necessary to build revolution first of all or even within the lifestyles and cultures of the proletariat um and i, I wanted mean, yeah go ahead go ahead carlos i wasn't going to say much more no you could finish i just i, I thought you were going towards like a question um, mm. be, no, no, no. Um, I, w- I was just, oh God, now I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. No, I, I was just going to say that that's a really good point that you bring up, um, half about, you know, the, the, the way that that question of, uh, police violence is approached. Cause it, you know, it, it ignores so much that comes before that. And it does seem to be embedded in the sort of, um, middle class factionalism uh, mm-hmm. that isn't all too popular around working people. Um, that's not to say that the concerns which lead people towards those positions aren't concerns that are shared by the working class. You know, the, the violence of the armed bodies of the state, you know, namely the police. Uh, but the way that they're addressed by regular working people are usually somewhat uh, from a different angle than the way that they're addressed by middle class folks. I also wanted to mention that. You know, there's concrete instances of of Marx and Engels as they're organizing within the First International and later on in the German Social Democratic uh, Party of them warning different segments of the ruling party against the influence of the middle class intelligentsias Um, quite repeatedly. They mentioned, you know, you can let these folks in. It's not like they can't participate, but the precondition for them coming in is that they're not bringing in middle class petty bourgeois consciousness as as a baggage that they're entering that they're bringing into the organization they have to he almost word for word says convert their their outlook into a proletarian outlook um and you know that's uh that's possible it's just that it's it's a lot harder for that possibility to concretize itself when the vast majority of the left is a part of that middle class you know, that's something that the Communist Party was really good at back in the day yeah. and just isn't anymore. Now, personally, I think it, it can be again, right? That's sort of what we want to do. And that's something that a question we need to tackle is reproletarianization happens. But back in the day, if you were if you were a lawyer or or, you know, a doctor or whatever, and you wanted to join the party, that was fine. You went into an atmosphere, though. There was a proletarian atmosphere and they would not put up with that middle class kind of thing going on. They just wouldn't, um, especially under Henry Winston, who was very, very, very much concerned with that kind of thing. I wanted to maybe ask a, a question that was given to us through a super chat by Jay Rosales. Um, he says, I thought the rule of thumb is to organize where you are at. If DSA is where you are at, Shouldn't we organize within DSA in our local context? Uh, what do you guys have to uh, respond to that? I, my understanding of that phrase, organize where you're at, is organizing your own local community. So, 
your own local community is is you know it's your neighborhood it's uh maybe this the school your kids go to the church you're a part of that's that's organizing where you're at uh the dsa is a political organization you shouldn't consider it um i i, I wouldn't say you should consider it you know <laughs> you know, your home locale, uh, you need to be going out there and, and, and trying to organize, uh, you know, your own community. Uh, but if you're in the DSA, I would say there are some local chapters of the DSA that on a local level have good, um, you know, class focused projects. And if you see good work happening there, I, 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 I support that. I, I would encourage that. And the DSA is a bit of an odd organization in this in in the sense that, uh, yeah, local local chapters do have a lot of uh, a lot of freedom and a lot of control over what they do, uh, but uh, many of us in Class Unity found our own local DSA chapters to be totally dysfunctional or totally captured by, um, you know, middle class liberals uh, who don't care about. Uh, class politics who don't organize uh, for, you know, uh, on serious bread and butter issues like, like healthcare or housing. Uh, so I, I think, um, I, I think if you see good things happening in your own local DSA chapter, that's fine. Uh, but if not, there are tons of ways of organizing your own local community without the DSA. And in some way, in some, in some cases being, uh, and the DSA will be an obstacle to that. I, honestly, me, I find organizing in my neighborhood the most rewarding organizing there is. And I, I mean, with the Institute, that's a whole different animal. But there's nothing better to me than setting up our Halloween celebration for the kids every year. You know, it, when when your community gets together and there's just hundreds of people around and it's just an atmosphere of joy and togetherness. There's nothing in the world like that. And that is what we want every day. That's why we fight for socialism. I'm in a very poor part of Cleveland, right? I live on the East side and our last Halloween thing, even the cops were able to come and have a good time. Usually cops come around. Everyone's gone. Right. Even the cops were laughing with the parents and joking with the kids. It was amazing. And that kind of stuff is very, very important to get involved with, especially if you're interested in revolutionary politics, because it gets you used to talking to people. It gets you enmeshed with the working class of your community. You learn their concerns. You learn their issues, their problems. You learn what's good for them, et cetera. Crack Mama yeah. Jokes has a very good comment here who says uh, there's not there's a not poor side of Cleveland. No, no, there isn't. <laughs> oh, we want to thank uh, uh, C. Blaze uh, for, for the $5. Uh, doing that. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're doing that thing where I go to click to, to open the door and you open it and, the, and they <laughs> keep doing it at the same time so we can't open it. Um, listening to this while on the dime of the U.S. government, uh, starting late, sadly, but glad to waste time with listening to this. Thank you, C. Blaze, for the super chat. Um, Thank you, C. Blaze. So I, I think we've we've covered the uh, the DSA, uh, the reason why you guys left, and the subject of the middle class somewhat mm -hmm. thoroughly. I one more to... thing, Carlos. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to, like, I, I know people are sort of, they, they may have questions about why we're saying these things. Marx and Engels wrote a great deal about this kind of stuff, guys. Just look into it. There's a reason Engels said that owning a house made someone no longer proletarian, right? There's a stability to middle-class life that changes your consciousness. There just is. That's true. Um, and, uh, you know, as the, as the First World War is taking root and there's this global split in socialism, uh, Lenin, one of the reasons, uh, one of the central reasons why he sees the positions that were taken by many other parties in the West 
was because of the material incentives, um, which were grounded on that, which is, um, I don't think he would describe those as middle class. He used the term aristocracy of labor or labor aristocracy. But the point is that there's a material incentive that although somewhat uh, adjacent or, or similar uh, in terms of class position to the working class, fundamentally makes its class interests different mm-hmm. from, from the working class. And that's something that has to be combated. And I think a similar sort of uh, way of approaching this phenomenon um, in, in the sense that it has to be combated, but it's not the ultimate antagonism. The ultimate antagonism is still, you know, the monopoly capitalists, um, not the middle classes, but that influence still has to be combated within the working class movement. Um, but I wanted to switch towards the, the second topic that we were going to hit on uh, today, which is uh, the subject of your recent class unity course. Um, before we get to the topic of that, which is fascism, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the classes that class unity does? Uh, if anyone is interested in getting involved, can you tell them how they can sign up for them? What are some of the classes you've done in the past? And then after that, we'll shift towards talking about the fascism one you just finished doing. Yeah, so our education committee has been um, pretty busy over the last couple of years. We've developed a, um, a, I'd say, pretty robust series of courses covering a variety of topics. Um, we have one that's simply an intro to CU, and so it covers you know some basic writings of Marx and Engels, but then also uh, gets into more contemporary issues. Um, and then we've had uh, classes covering uh, issues like comparisons between Marxism and non-Marxist economic theory in the 20th century, um, uh, classes on fascism, which we uh, are here to talk about today. And we also have an upcoming class on imperialism, which will be beginning on Sunday, uh, April the 16th. And really, our, our goal for um, political education is to understand the contemporary world, the world of contemporary ca- capitalism in the Marxist vein and tradition. So of course, we're taking concepts from the mid 19th century, which was a very different world. And we're seeing how they allow us to make sense of uh, the, the intervening 170 years or so. So everything from the industrial revolution and everything that came about from that, the world wars, fascism, globalization, financialization, um, all of these developments um, that are still nonetheless able to be analyzed within the framework of class struggle, so within the basic Marxist categories. Uh, Really, I think what our overall commitment is to making sure that Marxism isn't just like an academic subject. It's not just theory that you know because it makes you feel smart or something. It actually helps you make sense of the world. And that's the challenge for, you know, whether you're coming at it from a proletarian angle or not, is how do I fit in with like the, the incomprehensible complexity of global industrial civilization? And, um, you know, we, we rely on, as I said, uh, sort of like the classic works in uh, Marxist history. We, you know, we, cover, we try to see different perspectives from like the Second International, um, Soviet writers, but then also um, sort of the contemporary, uh, you know, what have you, cultural politics or whatever. It's really... So uh, the overall aim in all of this is to just pr- promote a robust Marx-founded understanding of the modern world, which you know we're all a part of, whether we want to, whether we want to be or not. I mean, we're kind of stuck with it, but um, I think you know it's 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 illuminating. I think once you, I, I I personally speaking don't know how to make sense of contemporary America over the past hundred years without Marxism. I don't know how anyone does it. I guess they don't. But um, so our, our that's that's our program essentially. And it's open to anyone. You don't have to be a class unity member. Um, you don't have to, you know, sign a pledge or anything. Just show up. Um, we have, you know, fresh readings every week and we'll go over it. We'll have people there who have, you know, maybe been through the material before, are able to explain it. Um, so our, our goal is just to promote um, 
a popular avenue for understanding the world in Marxist terms. That's wonderful. So often these days we hear people go one way or the other. They become, you know, a, a theory nerd, right? And they just yeah. spend all their time reading and, and they can quote you a thousand things that Lenin said. But to understand Lenin, you must understand the doing as well. You must under you. There's no. And then on the other half, you get people that says, we just got to get out there and do something. Right. Yeah. Just do something. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Just do it. And that makes no sense. You could be doing something that could aid your class enemy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you need both. And that's what Marx and his 11th theses on Porbach was all about. Right. They sort of, there's a lot of misrepresentations these days. And that's why I really respect what you guys at Class Unity do, because you're doing both. You're doing precisely what conclusions Marxism leads you to do. Um, but let's let's sort of zone in on fascism, because that's your, your, your most recent course. We often find the misunderstanding of what fascism, fascism is to be one of the central components behind right opportunism and tailing of the Democratic Party. Uh, what are some of the frequent misunderstandings that you guys encounter? What role do you see uh, these playing in the sort of PMC politics often found in socialist organizing in this country? I think the, yeah, the current narrative that we see about fascism or the current discourse we see around fascism on the democratic in the democratic party and you know all, all its institutions is whatever the republicans are doing at this moment that's fascist uh you need to vote blue in order to prevent the fascist takeover of, of america and i think on the right we see it a little bit as well uh like right wing you know talking heads of the Republican Party love to paint, uh, you know, Democrats as, you know, uh, the opposing free speech, therefore authoritarian, therefore fascist. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't really think it gets any deeper than that. Uh, I think uh, there have been sort of um, academic attempts to... Um, understand fascism in a way that makes it uh uh you know the belief uh in you know um like holding bigoted beliefs is what fascism is so if you know if if you're a republican you know if and you know you know, if you're, you know, racist or you hate women or gay people or something that makes you fascist. And uh, that's, uh, that. there's no way that can be right because we know that, um, you know, racism, sexism, homophobia, all the, all the bigotry has existed before fascism. Uh, they exist in, in countries that aren't fascist. Uh, they exist, <laughs> they exist in people that aren't fascist. So uh, that's, I don't know. It's hard to even engage with that sort of argument because it's like, how, where do you begin? It's just clearly wrong. Uh, so I, I don't even know if there's something worth addressing in the current discourse about <laughs> uh, fascism um, besides offering the, the Marxist alternatives. Yeah. I mean, I think one problem is like, as soon as you say the word fascism, everyone immediately thinks Nazism. And of course, the moral problems are of Nazism were so outrageous that, that, that that's what people sense the fascism is, is, you know, this just outrageous moral failure. And I think the way that we've tried to conceptualize it is that there's, a, it's, there's an economic basis to this. And so if I think people maybe think of fascism as sort of like a political accident, like fascism is what happens when the wrong people find themselves in power, tragically. And our um, basic claim that we developed in our course is that um, really this was a matter of economic necessity. 
And specifically, it's a part of the economic necessity that arises from the nature of industrial production. Mm. And so in Marx's terms, in the jargon of capital, you would say it's a contradiction between the mode or rather the means of production, the productive forces, which is industrial technology as it's been refined and rationalized, uh, you know, over the interwar period and uh, so on. So um, that on um, the one hand, but what, what this, so the contradiction between that and then the relations of the production, which are the market. So what does this mean? So basically if once you have an advanced uh, industrial um, base of production, so whether it's a steel mill, an oil refinery, it's a very large investment of capital. The capitalists who uh, found the whatever you know uh, factory this is, it's a large investment of labor, capital, raw materials, expertise. It's a huge investment. Lots of debt is taken on to fund this. And so the logic of production means that if you have invested in all of this complex um, you know, means of production, if it is not being used, then you are losing money. You are um, losing on your investment and you uh, risk you know, going under financially. And so this impulsion to produce um, produces certain paradoxes and contradictions. So for example, if production becomes vastly more efficient as it did during the industrial revolution, you have a great many more products available to sell, but eventually you're gonna flood your market and there's gonna be no market for your products. So the market has to expand itself just to be able to sell its products at market and be able to recoup the cost of production. So insofar as industrial capitalism depends on an ever expanding market for its, for its products to meet its, the demands of its industrial base. So what happens in a case where you have this industrial capacity that you need to keep producing and to be able to bring your goods to market, but the market's collapsed. There's a depression. There's, uh, you know, the, the whole global economy is in the toilet and there is essentially no market for um, your industrial product. So what do you do? How do you, um, how, how, how do you um, appropriate the surplus of production, the excess of productive capacity that essentially is in conflict with the market because there's not a mo enough market demand to meet it? And the answer that you know, really emerged in the 30s in Germany, but also in America was armaments. And so the investment in armaments is conceptualized as an economic necessity simply to because the market is uh, unable to um, uh, meet the demands of production. So the needs of industrial production and the needs of the market come into conflict with one another. And the solution is investing in uh, uh militarization and the production of bombs, uh, tanks, airplanes, all manner of, you know, uh, industrial uh, means of warfare. Um, so, yeah, so in that sense, the political aspect of fascism, which is, you know, right wing authoritarian militarism becomes a, a political necessity necessitated by these underlying and, um, economic conditions, which are of the nature of industrial capitalism itself. And it, I think really the proof of this is the fact that um, in the 30s and 40s, first, I mean, you know, before the war really destroyed the country, Nazi Germany's economy improved. Armament saved industry from the depression. And the same thing happened for America. Armament brought us out of the depression. And our analysis really kind of then extends beyond, you know, 1945, essentially, if armament becomes an essential component that keeps um, industrial economy by um, being able to um, uh, invest the surplus of production, then that's something that essentially the American military as, you know, the global superpower.
power has been into these. So that that's um so that's maybe a little jargony, but that's 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 the basic idea of um, where we're coming from is to analyze the economic mechanism that necessitates the um, uh, assertion of far right. Um, authoritarian politics. And I mean, another thing is this does go back to Marx. If you look at his, um, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon, basically what he's describing is that the uh, bourgeoisie of the time sacrificed their political rights, that is their, you know, their Republican control of French society in exchange for a regime that protected their industrial rights or their economic rights rather. Likewise, uh, you know, German industrial capital in the early 30s opted for, um, you know, uh, the support of, of right-wing authoritarianism, sacrificing their political liberties for their economic interest. So that, that's kind of the overall picture that we're working from. Well, it's absolutely brilliant. That is the historical materialist analysis of fascism, especially regarding Germany. Um, a lot of people don't know that was the first military industrial complex that mm -hmm. history had ever seen. Right. Yeah. And well, it even goes, yeah, it even goes back. I mean, the, the military industrial complex is just sort of a feature of any industrial society. I mean, it even goes right. back to the American civil war, which was the first war with like mm -hmm. ironclad ships and submarines, mm -hmm. but the years prior to world war one, um, I mean, when you had the consolidation of monopoly capitalism in Europe and America, um, I mean, that was one of the the, the economic mechanisms was arms race. And well, I mean, this, this I should say this, industrial uh, it, it is a very big operator in the phrase military industrial complex. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I should I should have clarified that. But yeah, no, you're yeah. you're absolutely right. And I, what I want to focus on is what Eric is saying right now perfectly highlights all of the distortions and why there are so many mistakes. And it always ends in a mistake of what we call idealism, that they believe that these people who just have these really horrible, evil ideas sneakily get their way into power and somehow get all these other evil people behind them and start making things evil. That's not how it happens. To use a little more Marxist jargon in it, because I love my Marxist jargon, um, <laughs> fascism is the negation of the the liberal bourgeois order, but without the progressive forces having organized it up yet to overthrow it and create the new thing. So it is a, a, an empty negation that leads to reaction because a negation has to create something, right? Negation is at the same time creating something else. And so you see what, you know, Dimitrov, called the uh, open terroristic dictatorship of the most reactionary elements of finance capital, right? Because the most reactionary are the ones taking power in this situation. It can't be any other way. And so if we understand it from a material basis, we understand the 18th Brumaire as an embryonic fascism. We understand the destruction of reconstruction and the early KKK as an embryonic fascism. This is the material view of fascism. And that's one of the reasons I, I, I love reading about your course on this, because it's so good and so necessary right now when we have people who call themselves socialists, who even call themselves Marxist Leninists or communists saying, Trump's a fascist, we gotta fight. That fascist Trump, man, they've been saying that since 1950 about every Republican. Those are Democratic operators. Absolutely. It's so important when, when you have this materialist analysis of, of fascism, you realize that it's not something that just pops out of a void. And you're just like, wow, where the hell did this come from? It was always there um, in, in, in bourgeois society and it arises naturally out of the same conditions which provide the opportunity for socialist transformation to arise, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The same periods of crisis. And uh, I think, you know, in the U.S., what better example than, than Reconstruction, right? You genuinely had in the U.S. South the construction of dictatorships of labor 
in various parts of the South. And that was overthrown in 1876 by a counter-revolution of property, and it instituted that terroristic dictatorship of capital that uh, Dimitrov talks about. And it was carried out through KKK and different uh, sorts of fascistic organizations. So I, I think that there's this tendency, especially in how we, we speak about fascism uh, on the left, which really seems to more and more be just be a reflection of, you know, the quotidian understanding, the, the regular social understanding of fascism um, as this thing that's both far away something other than capitalism at a specific point in its development um, and something that's very individualized. And I think that your development, your materialist development of, of fascism um, is a really good antidote uh, uh, to that shallow and superficial understanding, which is prevalent. Yeah. No, and Carlos, you're absolutely right to, to point out that this arises from sort of the same economic conditions that make socialism possible. I mean, like Marx says that the change in the mode of production comes from the contradiction between productive forces and uh, relations of production. So in this case, between industry uh, and market. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's warfare is just like another means of sort of finessing the fundamental contradiction of uh, industrial market economies. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that it really is the tragic dimension of it, is that the same conditions that actually could result in socialism in order to preserve class privilege becomes the terrorism of the finance capital against the proletariat. And, you know, who, who are the people who, um, who are given the guns and have to, you know, actually go fight and die in the trenches? It's the working classes. So, yeah. You know, what the really scary thing is, and why all these distortions are so dangerous and classes like yours are so beneficial is because there is a danger of fascism in our era. Make no mistake about that. We're experiencing the same contradiction growing to a more developed point between finance, capital, uh, value manipulation and debt manipulation. And the inability of the working class to get by. Um, and that that's a really complicated process. It's sort of mystified on three levels, but we don't need to get through that. We're growing closer. We are, we're right now entering a general crisis of finance capital, worse than 2008, because 2008 was based in fraud. This is based in how fully financialized capital actually works right the system working as it should is developing this impossibility and we if we're going on and on about how the republicans are fascists we will miss an actual fascist danger by failing to organize ourselves yeah and, i mean you kind of like what's maga fascism compared to like citizens united like isn't that the real fascism like the fuck you know precise. the actual completely control of our political process by corporations and banks I mean, we just had a president illegalize a democratically chosen um they just illegalized the rail workers right to strike um, it completely violated democratic processes. And it was done in the interest, not just of rail companies, right? Of course, they were in the interest of rail companies that have, you know, record profits um, as they're cutting corners, making conditions more unsafe for workers, for the communities through which these railroads pass by. But who's backing these railroad companies? Who are the key shareholders? It's finance capital. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest finance capitalist in the world who are backing this. So you have, I don't know what other way to, to say it, you know, the, a, a perfect example of the state crushing the democratic rights of, of working people uh, in order to protect the interest of, of big capital and ultimately at the, the highest form of capital, finance capital. Yeah, I, I do think there might be a disagreement there about... Um, what causes fascism and are, are the economic conditions that cause fascism exactly the same as the economic conditions that cause socialism uh and in in our course we we read various um marxist authors and um i don't know if i don't know if there's um you know uh like a, a firm class unity uh view what exactly is fascism uh, that's not usually how we do our courses we just it's just more you know engaging with the material and we're free to have disagreement 
So I think some Marxist authors um, have the belief that the economic conditions that give rise to the socialist movement are exactly the same as those that give rise to the fascist movement. I think Trotsky says behind every fascist movement is a failed socialist movement. Um, but the the view the views uh, that I that I personally have gravi gravitated towards are those of of Alfred Sonrethel and uh, Mikhail Kalecki, who identify uh, fa the source of fascism more in the uh, particular uh, the particular ration of the arms economy uh, to the rest of the economy uh, in Germany or other countries. And you can have um, you can have those give rise to fascism uh, without giving rise to a socialist movement, and vice versa. Uh, I think so. In Germany, if, if for example, <clears throat> you had a a big number of really powerful um, rich oligarchs who had money heavily invested in uh, steel industry, and who. Uh, couldn't find an internal market for their steel uh, and they were too expensive to export to other countries. So they couldn't find uh, somebody to, to export to. So what did they do? They basically lobbied the, uh, the government to buy their own steel. Uh, and, you know, you have to come up with some sort of political excuse or justification for why the government buys all the steel. And, the political justification in Germany was um, uh, we're going to war, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually a pretty specific a political economic situation in which a, a large industrial, a large part of the industrial sector is going bankrupt and they need to manufacture uh, an arms race uh, just to stay afloat. Uh, and, uh, that's, I think, I think that's pretty specific. It, it, it was also, I mean, it, there's no coincidence that it was during a massive depression. So, uh, that's true, but I think, I think it's more specific than that. Right. Well, I think we disagree. So now we have to hate each other and never speak again. Right. Or old school Western cool. shoot off. Mm -hmm. Can we bring that back? No. <laughs> I want to say real quick. Uh, yeah, for us, I mean, in the Marxist-Leninist tradition, it's it, all of that is within the general crisis of imperialism itself. Um, uh, we're mostly familiar with Marxist authors, so I'm not sure who this Tritsko guy or Trats guy or whoever he was. I have no idea who that is. So, <laughs> um, we, re <laughs> but the the general sort of authorities uh, that we come from are Georgi Dimitrov, obviously, and also our palm Dutt has a very good one that really gets into the, the social consciousness issue of, of what is created within this and how sort of political revolutions and social revolutions form. And he goes at it from that way. And so a social revolution forming is the um, last step, right? That is the working class taking power. Uh, but a political revolution is something different. It is something that changes the basic social relations of society. So the civil rights movement, for example, is a political revolution, right? Uh, after the civil rights movement, we see a very big turnaround in American culture. We see uh, gradually, obviously, um, in, in, an end of overt racism as the dominant social relation and more of anti-racism and or either that or ambivalence uh, as a dominant social relation. So what he talks about is the social rela the social revolution failing within Germany, whereas the right had a political revolution based on the same sort of crises that could create a socialist movement, could create any sort, depending on the classes that are able to organize and most insert themselves subjectively into those objective conditions. 
Yeah, yeah, and I wanted to say that um, I think that the there is a point of uniformity in in both uh, understandings, which is that we're trying to understand the phenomenon of fascism mm-hmm. as it arises out of you know material conditions that are constantly developing, um, which are already there. It's kind of the same camp as opposed to you know the liberal understanding or the quotidian understanding. But I just wanted to ask, because um, you mentioned that uh, crisis in industrial capitalism, which forces it to shift towards military production. Um, would you say then that everything we've had since the 70s is fascism? Because the rate of profit fell to a point where there was really two options for the capitalist class in the US around the 70s, during the 70s crisis. Um, either take industry abroad somewhere else um, and where you can pay labor less and, and still get a, a decent uh, r- uh, rate of profit. Or there's a, a background noise somewhere. Um, yeah. um, or you can, um, it's not like a coin spinning of sorts. <laughs> um, or, or, uh, or you can go down the route of financialization. Um, and our, our friends of the Institute, the uh, economist Alan Freeman and, and Radhika Desai, they've written a ton about, about this. Um, and it's, it's very great work. I'd, I'd recommend it. But um, clearly the route that was taken in the U.S. was financialization. And the phenomenon, which we talked about a little bit earlier of the middle class, its fall, it's related to that shift in how the capitalist decides to reinvest his capital, where he decides to reinvest his capital and the shift towards investing it. In, in, in financial speculation, in interest, and in other forms of, of capital investments. Um, but the only area of industrial capital that continues to sustain an investment and that you know just completely explodes around the post-war period, uh, but you know around the 70s as well, is the military industrial complex and uh, military production. Really, there, there's only two industries which are um, within productive uh, capital that are still being developed in the U.S., which is the medical pharmaceutical industrial complex and and the military industrial complex. So would you say that because of that being the only place where industrial capital has really survived in the U.S., would you say that that uh, constitutes fascism? Yeah, I mean, that's a delicate question, of course. I think like our, our we would say that uh, sort of the industrial base of arms race, I mean, it, it never really stopped after, during from the war. I mean, the World War II arms race is what brought America out of the Depression. And then after World War II, you had the Cold War, you had the nuclear arms race, you had the space race. So the, the investment and you know military and military adjacent technologies as sort of a backbone part of the american economy was something that is more or less continuous uh you know over the past 80 years or so um so then i I guess the question um does this make america a fascist country in the sense that a large part of our industrial base in concert with our politicians i mean this is another perhaps sin about against the squad and AOC and those people is voting for like arms for Ukraine and so forth. But, you know, in so far as like both of our political parties are essentially war hawks, they are for mm-hmm. the continual and perpetual warfare, um, uh, you know, all over the world, then, yeah, you could say that in the political economic sense, that's fascist. It's it's the perpetuation of warfare out of economic need. And I mean, hey, Eric, can I interrupt one sec? Oh, I, just yeah, want to, I, I really want you to continue. I just have to say this. How does someone call themselves an anti-fascist fighter when they are letting Americans go hungry and struggle day by day and go homeless while taking tax money and giving it to doctrinaire neo Nazis. That's who they're using yeah. as their hammer against Russia right now. Doctrinaire neo-Nazis. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eric. 
I'm really sorry. Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's it's it's, 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 it's an elaborate money laundering organization. You know, like mm-hmm. the politicians vote for arms payments. The arms payment goes to the, you know, the major corporations, Boeing, who, Northrop Grumman, whoever. And then they give the money back to the politicians as lobbying funds. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's corruption um, for the sake of perpetual war. Now, why why would America be in the position of waging perpetual war? It's because we're the global economic hegemon. And, you know, like the world wars in the broadest sense were fought over control over the global economy. Like through the 19th century, England was in control. Germany wanted what England had. They were trying to force their way into control of the global economy. It didn't work. And what you got instead was America, you know, taking the pie at the end of the day. So insofar as um, we are the controllers of the uh, global capitalist economy, um, there's no way to do that without heavy investment in an army and a navy to make sure that other countries are buying your stuff um, and so on. So, I mean, this is this is the sense in which, um, I mean, uh, military expenditure is necessary just to maintain the, you know, global trade order, essentially. Um, uh, what, what NATO likes to call the rules-based order of the world or, or what have you. Um, so... Yeah, so I mean, it, it it's just it, it's it's fundamental part of our economic life, and I mean, I I think maybe when if if you're saying, well, aren't you just comparing America to Nazi Germany? And I think maybe one big difference is that we largely export conflict. I mean, Hitler ended up getting Germany leveled back to the Stone Age, which wasn't so good for them. But for us, if we can export the conflict, say, to Vietnam or Korea or you know Ukraine, the Middle East, wherever, then we get the benefits, the industrial benefits, the, uh, you know, the, the um, economic benefit of armament and militarization without having our entire um, country leveled and you know reduced to rubble and so forth but yeah i i mean i even forget who's who said this it was some i think it was george kennan who's you know sort of one of like the the og um you know uh american war hawk kind of containment policy guys he basically said like in the 90s that you know uh to 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 stop the sort of cold war belligerence between america and russia was an unacceptable blow to the american economy so like why would we stop you know so but yeah i mean the point is to understand it as uh you know it, it's 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 the, po- the political aspect of this, which in our reality is just the bipartisan support of constant warfare, um, arises from uh, fundamentally economic need. But yeah, it's a complicated issue. And I think as soon as you start saying, you know, America is a fascist country, like, you know, fascism is a loaded term. And I think like, you know, the social aspects of fascism, the moral aspects, I mean, there are differences. I think you have to assess like different countries in their own terms, in terms of like their own historical state and uh, so on. But the the there's a continuity in the economic motivator behind the whole thing. It works for Germany until the war, you know, and it works for America. And um, instead of Germany becoming the global economic hegemon, America got it. And that's what we've been invested in perpetuating ever since. Yeah, Eric, I would uh, just add, um, I think one big difference. So as far as like, is America fascist or not? I think, you know, I kind of see these things on a continuum. Like, I think it's, I mean, yes, we know Nazi Germany's fascist and we know some other country probably isn't, but really it's a continuum. Um, I guess what I would add that's unique about the Germany situation was um, they were under the conditions of a uh, Versailles Treaty. And so they had very little access to capital outside of their borders as a result of that. And in fact, um, in 1924, um, you know, after they had a hyperinflation problem, they um, they renegotiated the terms of the Versailles Treaty. Um, it was called the Dawes Plan. And what that entailed was sending uh, capital from the previous allied powers into Germany um, to rebuild their industrial base, uh, specifically uh, iron and steel um, production, uh, to help uh, build up their industry. And the idea was they can re- 
they can pay back the reparations um, through their industrial goods. So this causes a big boom in Germany. Um, and the, the problem is, is when 1929 happens, when the Great Depression starts, um, they build up all this industrial capacity um, and they've rationalized and streamlined the process so that, you know, you get a United Steel Trust that um, requires very little uh, manual labor to keep going. In Marxist jargon, this would be called variable capital. There's very little variable capital involved in the production process. So the problem with that is um, you, um, like when a depression happens and there's no more demand for your product, you have to keep producing. Uh, because if you stop producing, um, you're gonna sell even less of your product. So you're in this bizarre situation where you're compelled to keep producing even though there's no market for it. Um, so I think the aspect of, you know, I think the big difference between the United States and a country like Germany is the fact that the United States is the world hegemon. Like Germany had the ambition to um, expand their reach in order to produce their own monopoly market to bring themselves back to profitability. Whereas the United States is already at the top and they're trying to manage the system globally so so that'd be right yeah i mean we we, we have the the henry kissinger approach which is to you know we're going to take fascism to you <laughs> you know uh, right miley faces at home fascism <laughs> abroad yeah, yeah. that's very, like very well pizza. um our carlos mentioned earlier uh, a close friend of the institute radica desai uh talks about how America was facing a choice um, between financialization and export and it, the whole thing. But what it really comes down to is what you were just talking about, Andy, is that uh, technology takes a leap. And therefore, it's so much less variable capital or labor or congealed labor or socially necessary labor or whatever you want to call it that goes into creating commodities and this affects the general crisis and makes it continue getting uh, quicker and quicker, bigger and bigger, et cetera, which makes speculation and financialization the only really smart option. And so this for us is why finance capital plays a gigantic role in, in fascism. And it is this ruling class that fascism ultimately serves or would serve here. I also think that the disagreement isn't that profound because I, I wouldn't disagree with it being the case that in like, I'm going to use imperialism incorrectly because imperialism is a stage of capitalism, but what people usually think about what people usually think of imperialism as is just militarism outside. I think that is, you know, a central component that's usually found in fascism, which is itself takes different forms in different places. There's no such thing as abstract fascism. Of course, it concretizes in a variety of ways. Um, but I think that one of the things that uh, that we're definitely in agreement with is that either way, um, once you have a materialist understanding of fascism, it seems kind of absurd to listen to the argument from either party that the other one is fascist and therefore they are the lesser evil and they should vote for them, which is an argument that is more uh, frequent within the people that try to get you to vote for the Democratic Party. We talked about DSA earlier. It's an argument that's frequent in DSA. It's frequent in other organizations on the left, mm -hmm. uh, which claim to be outside of the Democratic Party and independent of it, but for the last 60, 70 years have just continued the same narrative. Um, and I think one of the paradox uh, today is that this form of fascism is is a fascism which perpetuates itself in part through the claim of it fighting fascism, even mm -hmm. while it sends more than a hundred billion to neo Nazis. So it's 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 one big old paradox and topsy turvy situation. But how do you guys see that? Because it I, it can't, it's the, the irony, it's just, it's so in your face 
to have people say, we're going to fight fascism at home, we're going to defend democracy, but it be the same party that's at the vanguard of sending hundreds of million, billions, more than a hundred billion dollars, you know, to, to a little fascist uh, state uh, with, you know, folks that, I mean, try to find someone without a, a swastika tattoo. Um, it's pretty hard. It's harder than, you know, one of those uh, where's Waldo books where you're, you're trying to look for Waldo. You know, try to find for one, try, try to look for one without a skull and bones tattoo or without an SS. You know, Impossible. Thing. <laughs> yeah. So um, what do you guys think of that sort of paradox? Okay, yeah, well, it is I'll, funny. Okay. Is oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was only going because yeah. I didn't see one of you guys doing it. No, <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Uh, it is funny uh, seeing, you know, both sides, but mainly the Democratic Party, you know, try to find these like tiny differences between the Democratic and the Republican Party and saying that, look at these, look at these uh, like characteristics of like Republican rhetoric that we don't have. That's what fascism is. That's why the Republicans are fascists and you got to go out and vote for the Democratic Party. It's fascism just Fascism is mixing up pronouns. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, Republicans mix up pronouns. They hate trans people. That's what fascism <laughs> is. Go, go vote for the Democratic Party. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like, it's like ask people in Iraq, like, how do you, what's the difference? Like, who's the fascist? The Republicans or the Democrats? You know, it's kind of, it becomes absurd. You know, like, these are, <laughs> these are just kind of the distractions we use to assuage our own consciousness. And, you know, this is this is sort of a feature of um, what we've kind of been talking about, like the middle class ideology is like on the one hand, it's totally complicit in like overseas wars, you know, drone bombing children, the whole nine yards, you know, and th it's more or less not even commented on. It's just taken for granted. It's like you can you can like run on a platform. No, I will not drone bomb children. I guarantee you, you will be drone bombing children by the end of the week. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's. It's, it's just kind of the fundamental absurdity that people can get wrapped up in these, you know, sometimes with merit, but sometimes fairly asinine sort of like moral hygiene type issues. But um, at the same time, like just the, the reality of the violence that is perpetrated just to keep American economic empire running is just, it's just beyond comprehending. And so, you know, a lot of the sort of, um, just the the cultural war shibboleths or whatever it's just kind of like okay that's it, it, we're talking about two different things here yeah i think and, and as for the sort of right opportunists and liberals who like to call themselves communists who it, it doesn't matter how hip and revolutionary and cool and justicey sounding their rhetoric is if the direct implications of it is aid to imperialism, it is imperialist rhetoric. If their actions are benefiting our ruling class, it is counter-revolutionary actions. And these people, therefore, need struggled against. And it doesn't matter how what their opinions are on issue one or issue two. What matters is the masses and the class struggle of all the disparate, different types of masses, be they gay or straight, black or white, whatever, against the ruling class that all of their rhetoric and action ends up serving. Also, I'll do another pen point for you. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um is there anything you'd like to uh, to touch on um, in terms of the topic of fascism? I think we might have covered that. Uh, we fairly... we covered like four questions just in conversation. Yeah, yeah. Well, like if you would like it, if you would like to hear more, um, we welcome all of your listeners to attend our um, our upcoming course on imperialism. Um, mm. It's really, it's from the same cloth. It's developing a lot of the same topics and issues. It's open to anyone who's interested. It starts uh, Sunday, April 16th. Um, I believe that's the correct date. Have to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central. And uh, should be a lot of fun, provocative thought, you know, 
real uh, thought provoking stuff. And uh, the date's correct. Had... I checked. Okay, wonderful. I shouldn't mm -hmm. know that, but um, yeah, I, we've had some just really wonderful discussions. Uh, I mean, personally, like my perspective on this has been transformed in ways that you know have been very beneficial so yeah i hope uh, if you're interested in learning more about these topics which i mean again these are sort of the foundational political economic issues of contemporary times um come come try to figure it out with us you know like none of us are experts we're not like you know we we don't have all the answers we're clueless and lost to sometimes but you know we're working through it together and uh it's uh yeah, it's been, I think um, we have a really strong program to offer. So I hope people stay tuned. And that's so important, especially uh, uh, because of the lack of attention that imperialism has usually had um, on the most dominant currents of, of, of Western Marxism and, and U.S. Marxism. Um, it's really, it's often given a secondary, um, a secondary spot. Um, but I don't think that today we can properly we can properly understand, you know, something like the legalizing of the rail strike or any other attacks that are being waged on the working class at home without understanding uh, imperialism and the sort of general shift in geopolitics that has been occurring over the last uh, few years. So um, it's uh, it's extremely important that I uh, I told Noah to put the the link in the chat, so it should be up there uh, pretty soon. But um, besides that imperialism course, is there any other courses that uh, you have uh, coming up that uh, you can promote? Yes, we are going to have a pretty in-depth reading of Marx's Capital, all three volumes coming up later. It should be beginning probably the first weekend of August. It's subject to change, but that's when we've uh, tentatively scheduled it. Um, it will be a pretty, I mean, we're, we're going into the text and getting into the nitty gritty um, details, but just to really have a thorough, comprehensive view of Marx's critique of capitalism, um, his major work, certainly. So, and you um, need all three. That's something we are very adamant about. You cannot understand one without two and three. Don't just read one. Um, honestly, if I have time, I I might want to join you guys for that. It's been a long please time. Do. Please do. Please do. Yeah. And uh, we love you guys, so um, yeah, the more the merrier. We're uh, as many people as we can get to attend. Uh, yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be intensive. Like we uh, we're not sparing on the technical details, but um, we're gonna have we're gonna have class. We're gonna be able to talk about it and explain it to you know help each other understand it. So um, awesome, yeah. awesome. Well, I can't wait. Yeah. Uh, I, I, go ahead, go go ahead. No, sorry. No, no, I I don't even remember what I was going to say exactly. <laughs> oh, I do I do remember. One of the great things about genuine people who genuinely want to work for socialism and build something real is that, do you notice when we disagree, it doesn't matter? Yeah, yeah. Check out their class if you can learn, right? Who cares what you disagree on about, you know, some historical figure or a writer or you know, what, what Bukharin said to Kamenev at the third Congress of the Bolshevik party, like that doesn't matter really. Like let's get together, figure out what we need to do and do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, political education is really important because a, it gives you, a, it gives you a way to understand the world, um, through like a scientific Marxist framework. And, um, you know, in, in class unity, we always try to we try to build a, a rigorous theoretical, you know, understanding amongst ourselves um, and disagreement will always be a part of that. And, and honestly, it is it's a good thing. It, it means that you're having a healthy, you know, health, healthy dialogue, uh, but always try to keep it with an eye to uh, furthering class politics and um you know, building uh, the workers' movement and and trying to give it a strong, you know, um, you know, a, a scientific um, direction, you know, and, and strategic direction. Uh, so we always try to keep uh, that in mind, uh, which is why, uh, like like you both said earlier, you have to combine the, the theory and the praxis. Uh, so I think that's that's one thing that we offer. It's it's a 
it's a network and a community of, of socialist organizers who really do want to apply uh, what we're learning. And to that end, uh, one of our, basically our first project is class unity. I want to, um, I'd like to say is um, we're preparing for the uh, very likely UPS strike that will happen over the summer. So if you are interested in getting involved and contributing to that, it's going to be a very big deal in the labor movement. Uh, so you can join class unity on our website. It's classunity.org. Um, if you, if you agree with anything we said here, uh, if you go on our website and you find yourself in agreement with a lot of what we say, uh, consider joining. We'd love to have you. Absolutely. Um, I'm sure we'll have you all back on, um, or, you know, folks from Class Unity in general back on, especially to talk about that UPS strike. You guys are also doing a bunch of other great stuff uh, in, in, in the community and in various uh, uh, working class um, uh, positions. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I thought this was a, a wonderful uh, conversation. Any last things that uh, any of you would like to say to plug um, social media, something? No, just thank you for having us. It's been a great discussion. And yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having thank us. you for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure, guys. Absolute pleasure. Likewise. Now when the after the uh, introduction video plays, we decide what sort of gulag sentence we'll give Hef for the disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just and I don't know who said that weird name I, I'd never heard before. <laughs> <laughs> but they need a sentence as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, folks. Uh, thank you all for watching. And, and thanks again to the Class Unity comrades for coming on and giving us such an insightful conversation. See you, everyone. <laughs>